but uh, thank you everyone for coming. I definitely do appreciate it. And I know I'm really looking forward to this one. I think Brian has some really exciting to, data to share and I've been interested for a while now in what Glenn's been doing with side dressing uh, manure over in Ohio. Uh, hopefully you can see some of it start to happen here in Iowa. And I just the other day got a call from someone who's interested in trying side dressing manure with some other new piece of technology from a company called Yield360. So I think there's lots of opportunities and lots of options. I think uh, the two presentations are going to complement each other well. And to get us started today, I think Rachel is hopefully going to have a poll that works for us. Yes. Okay. I'll go ahead and launch this then. So if you could take a minute to click an answer to the poll, we'd appreciate it. Uh, and then I think we're going to get started. Can everybody see it? I can. Okay. Melissa, can you see it? Okay. Jeff, can you see it? Okay. Hey, Jeff. All right, so hopefully those answers will start trickling in. I'm going to see if there's a way that we can share the results by the end of today so we can, we can talk about them. Uh, but with that, I think uh, first we're going to get started with uh, Glenn Arnold from the Ohio State University. Important to put the V in it, right? I guess. <laughs> so I've known Glenn for uh, a few years now, and I think his work is really interesting. Uh, he sort of pioneered this, this side dressing, and I think uh, he's going to share today some of the work he's been doing, and I look forward to seeing it. Right now I can see your slide view. There we go. Looks perfect. So I'll be quiet now, and thanks, Glenn. Great to have you today, and thanks for being here. All right, Dan. Thanks a bunch. I really appreciate the invite. I am... Um... As Dan said, I'm Glenn Arnold. I work for Ohio State. I've been, I was a county agent for 22 years before I switched full-time to working with manure. So we have quite an incentive. Um, hopefully this changed slides for you. This is um, the western part of Lake Erie. You can see the greenness. Those will be from Iowa. Primarily you hear about the, the hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico. Well, if you're from uh, northwest Ohio, you hear about western Lake Erie Basin. And the far left corner, is Toledo and that's where the Maumee River empties into uh, Lake Erie. It provides about oh I think only two or three percent of the water but 40 percent of the nutrient load if that's if the numbers are be, to be believed. So quite a pressure, quite a bullseye on those of us who live in northwest Ohio. And this is uh, the Toledo is right up here in the corner of the lake but you can see there's 88 counties in Ohio and that Western Lake Erie Basin touches 26 of the 88 counties. So it's uh, this is kind of our prime farm ground type area. So it's pretty important to, to look at this. And then before Lake Erie, down in the far left corner of the green block, that is Grand Lake St. Mary's. And that's a very, very shallow uh, lake. And it's had a lot of algae issues uh, 10 years ahead of Lake Erie. When I uh, years ago surveyed farmers at meetings i asked them what three months of the year represents when the majority of your manure is applied and you can see from this uh we apply about a half of our manure in the fall after crops are off are off and when you consider that this september would catch silage harvest because we usually start about the middle of september probably fair to say that uh six to seven out of ten gallons of liquid manure are probably fall applied in western ohio I've just listed here our, our application windows are dictated by the growing crops. Wheat acreage continues to decline. And then I've also said here that we need additional windows of manure application. Uh, we just need to uh, create as much as we can. Our dairy manure is stored outside, much like yours would be in Iowa. A lot of rainfall, a lot of wash water, a lot of lot runoff. Our pig manure is stored under the pit, much like yours probably is in Iowa. Our buildings are just pretty standard 2,450. We call them double wide buildings because they're just under the 2,500 permit level. And then 
as our newer beef facilities are built in the state, many of them are going to slats as well. They put a rubber mat on them. Uh, beef manure is uh, quite potent, considerably more potent than our, our hog manure is in the state of Ohio. So great to work with. We started plots many years ago with a small tanker, no compaction issue. In these four row research plots, you only harvest the two metal ones. So when you look at the weight of the tanker on the outside row, a small tractor pulling this small tanker, compaction wasn't an issue to work with. And over here, you can see a drag hose where we were flattening corn with a manure hose at the same time to determine how tall the corn could be. But this is the data set. I won't spend very much time on it, but the top half of this page is essentially pre-emergent manure work. So the corn was planted on a Monday and I'm in there by Wednesday with the manure on that little tanker. We, the control was 200 units of urea ammonium nitrate um, per acre. The swine manure rates were 5,000 gallons for both the surface applied and the incorporated. We picked 5,000 gallons because that got us 200 units of nitrogen. I know our manure is not as powerful as what you have in Iowa with all your distiller's grains, but we aimed for 200 pounds of nitrogen. Then we also did a dairy manure, and we did both the incorporated and the surface applied. And because dairy manure is much lower in nitrogen, uh, in addition to putting on the 13,500 gallons, which is our state limit, we also applied about 60 units of nitrogen using 28%. I'll get about 10 out of the uh, uh, dairy manure per, per thousand gallons, and then we added on. If you look at, we started in 2012, ran to 2016 with these plots, four pretty miserable growing years and one pretty good growing year. And then the bottom half of this page is simply post-emergent plots. We did the exact same treatments, only we did them at the V3 stage of the corn growth. So the corn was up and growing at the time. If you just compare the incorporated swine manure to the 28% UAN over the five-year average, manure did well, real well. You know, it was about 15 and a half bushel better on the pre-emergent plots, about 18 bushel better on the post. That was pretty cool, just to find out how we could use it. All the work I had done prior to this had been done on wheat as surface application. So it was kind of fun to play with uh, corn because we have a lot more corn acreage. If we threw the manure on top of the ground, we gave back the advantage and we lost about 10 to 12 bushel to the commercial fertilizer. So just as a thumb rule, you're about 25, 26 bushel less surface applied manure than incorporate if you have those options. We also looked at the dairy manure. Dairy manure was very, very similar to the hog manure. The incorporated dairy manure at that uh, high rate and the moisture involved, 158.7 is pretty similar to what we had with the incorporated swine manure. Down here at the bottom in the post-emergent plots, we were doing 163 with the uh, incorporated swine manure, 164 with the surface applied. Again, we felt like we did really well with that. So just, as the data set that we started with. This is what we did. Hey Glenn, before you move on, Adam yes. had a quick question there. Uh, he just wanted clarification on if you were using the same rate when you were surface applying manure. Yes, yes. So we're incorporating five and surface applying five here and here and surface applying 13.5 there, there, oops, incorporated and surface, incorporated and surface. So yes, same manure rates used all the time, yes. Again, this isn't like yours, but I always look at my nitrogen number. If I had to say, honestly, most Ohio farms, we run around 40 units of available nitrogen in a thousand gallons, and we run closer to 20, pounds of P2O5 in a thousand gallons plus our K2O. But what I look for is I look for a two to one ratio of available nitrogen and that ammonium is a nitrogen I primarily look for in hog manure because it's almost all ammonium nitrogen. But if I can get a two to one, then I got a pretty good product to side grass with. And why do I look for that? On a corn soybean rotation, if I want to put 200 pounds of nitrogen on with the manure, then I'm going to put about 100 pounds of P2O5 on. And over a two-year corn soybean rotation, I can pretty much use up both of those nutrients uh, nicely with that two-to-one ratio. And the other thing I drive home to a lot of people, whether they want to believe it or not, 
when you look at the value of the NPNK and liquid hog manure in those pits, at least 40% is the nitrogen, if not closer to 50% in this example, but that's a pretty big chunk of that manure, then that could be paid to, to make this application work. It pays for itself. So just always keep in mind that it's, when you say, I smell manure, I smell money, actually you're smelling that nitrogen that you're, you're leaving, leaving go. This is um, my university tanker. We've done well over 100 side-by-side -side plots uh, with the tanker, what we basically did is modified this. We took off the big flotation tires, had some special rims built by Underfirst Manufacturing. Farm Beer provided the funds for me to get a hold of a tanker like this. And we've done these six row um, manure side dress plots for many, many years before we switched to drag hoses. And really, I, I could probably name more than, more than 15 farmers in Ohio who have taken their own manure tankers and made them work. If you're really high in nitrogen, you know, those older manure tankers, those 3,000 gallons on down, many of them are on 90 inch centers. But this is 120 from center to center, just like the outside rows of tractor. But many of those old tankers were 90 inch centered tankers and the wheels are small enough to travel down through there. So I've had a number of guys just get smaller tankers and then adjust their tractor to make it straddle three rows of corn instead of two rows of corn. So just know that there are ways to work around some of these lim limitations. And I've got just Dietrich sweeps with closing wheels. I had to steal the metal, middle closing wheel off for a research tanker the other day. So that's why I've never got it back on this thing. But the other reason we use the Dietrich sweeps in, in addition to just good deep placement of the manure, and that is try to take some of the compaction out. When I ran side by side with this tanker and commercial fertilizer, over a five, six year period of time doing more than 70 plots, we were basically break even with commercial fertilizer. And because we were not break even in our small research plots, my analysis is that that big tanker compaction probably cost us 10 to 12 bushels of corn. And uh, maybe I would run these just a little deeper right behind a row or right behind a wheel if I had that to do over again. We eventually switched to drag hose systems. This is Tom Hara. The only reason I throw his picture out or his video out here first is that he's been the farmer in Ohio we work with for the longest. Now, this is a Zoski toolbar made in your home state there. Um, and this one, we drop the center unit out because sometimes when we get on softer soil, uh, we cannot, um, we don't want this hose to dig deep into the soil as we go across the field. And then we also run one and a half to both outside rows so that we have our, our skip row, our guest row, so to speak. And that all works out well. But Tom is unique in the fact that he plants his fields at a 45 degree angle to accommodate the drag hose. That way you don't have to have a hose humper. You don't have to have a second person in the field. And the hose uh, applicator just goes about this field just like uh, he would if there were no corn or no, nothing at all in there. So this is planted at a 45. If you look at his averages over the course of, uh, I think we have six years here, he runs right at 17 bushel batter with his manure strips than he does the three commercial fertilizer strips he leaves for us. And that's almost identical to what our small plot numbers were. So that makes me think that we've eliminated our compaction issue and make this work. Now Tom farms a couple thousand acres and he doesn't do every single acre this way. He just picks one building near one, or one field near one building each year. I think he has three buildings. So he tries to get around to three fields, but you know, many farmers say, oh, it'll be a cold day in hell, I'll ever do that. Well, that may be true, I understand that. But again, it's not every acre you farm, it's just the one you're gonna target for side dress. As we look at Tom's other numbers that he's pretty proud of, and I think are very important too, and that is the balance. If I look at his corn crop and figure a 200 bushel corn crop and a 65 bushel soybean crop, and if I look at the new tri-state fertility guide where corn withdraws 0.35 pounds of P2O5 and 0.20 pounds of K2O, over the course of a, so, of a corn year and then a soybean year here below, Tom will remove 121 pounds of P205 and 114 pounds of K2O out of his field. When he puts on 6,500 gallons of manure, 
he gets all the nitrogen he wants for a side dress. And then he's putting on 117 pounds of P205 and 143 of K2O. So he actually runs break even for the most part on P205 and slightly up on K2O, but not very much at all. So again, remember, it takes about 12 to 15 pounds added or subtracted from a, an acre to move your soil test at all. So he doesn't change it very much. He's pretty thrilled with that. The units we're running are rolling, are, uh, roller, rolling till coulters, basically a wavy coulter. You're putting manure, manure in the ground. Then you got the closing wheels. This happens to be a VTI unit. You can tell by this, this uh, rolling barrel depth control here. But Tom used one of these for a couple of years, and that means that barrel ran over every stock of corn in his field, yet he still got very good results with his side dress efforts. I think the other thing that I would emphasize, is we've made some pretty big changes in recent years on how the, we go about this. This is the old way, this would be the Tom way, so to speak, and that is we just take a, a square 40 acre field, we planted it at an angle and have in rows all the way around this field. And so your soft hose drag, drag applicator simply does one triangle of this field, then he'll simply do that crossover maneuver with his hose, and then he'll do the other half of the field. And it's, we've done this for, you know, we'll be closing on eight or nine years here pretty quick. The commercial applicators think it's cool. They don't have any problem with this. This is a window of time that they've never really experienced much opportunity. So they're using their very same equipment and they're able to, uh, to do quite well. The second method that we've worked with the hose is to lay the hose down the length of the end of the field and have a hose humper stationed there on the end of the field. And essentially, this guy's going back and forth, doing his manure application, and the hose humper's down here at the end waiting on him. You can see the building down there. And we can go out, you know, two, three miles without too much work, and make this work uh, pretty well for us. But the third way, and I credit my local farmers for this, because I, I was pretty mad when they wanted to do it this way. I, you know, I, I thought I handed you this great technology and here you are throwing it back at me. The third way that's I think maybe the long-term solution for the soft hose systems we're using is simply to put the hose in the, or the drag hose in the middle. So this is a field that was planted left to right and that's a north-south orientation. We put a bunch of spare hose over here when we start and we simply have the hose humper in the center and he's simply going to bring this hose forward as the applicator guy goes shooting by. This is a different field, but I just want to give you an idea. Hopefully you can follow this drone video. I got a drone last summer, so everybody has to tolerate at least a couple Arnold drone videos. But you can see where we've laid the hose out through his bean field. We're here in um, early June. We've put a lot of extra hose here. And then of course the drag goes over here. And then this dust cloud down here at the end is the applicator going back and forth. And this is a half mile field, and this has worked really, really well in our half mile fields. And the applicator guy's taking a break. He's talking to another neighbor who came over to watch and see what was going on. This is this farmer's third year of doing this. And if you want to fall in behind him, essentially he's putting on 5,000 gallons per acre using those roller, kit, roller coulter till toolbar here. This one, I think, is a Bazooka Farm Star. The university has three, uh, three toolbars. One's a Zoski, one's a Bazooka Farm Star, and one's a Dietrich. And you can see we don't get great coverage of this, but it works awful well. It seems to absorb rapidly into the soil. The yields have certainly been there. If we looked at this year in particular, we did about 1,000 acres of side dressing with different farmers in different counties. And on average, we were about, 15 bushel batter, 12 to 15 in all the fields. Um, so we're really, really pleased about this. And this little cross thing that you've got here, you see where the corn is actually going left and right instead of with the row. The farmer put some end rows in the middle just in case this was gonna be too big of a deal, uh, just in case we had to do half the field at a time. But we were able to do the full half mile field without really any pressure at all. And we do about 10 acres an hour. So if you're figuring it's gonna take, you know, um, 40 acres to empty out your pit, and we can get that done in about four, four hours. Now, to use this soft hose system, 
the corn can be the V4 stage, but not the V5 stage. And this happens to be V3 corn. You see that collar there, the first leaf out of the ground, shaped like your thumbnail. This leaf definitely has a true collar. This corn leaf definitely has a true collar, but this one does not. So this is v, V3 corn by our way of counting. And we can do V4 corn. Another way of doing it is just go up and step on it. If it doesn't snap off, the drag hose is gonna be fine. If it snaps off, then you're going to end up with suckers and you're not going to be very happy with the uh, 40 bushel reduction in yield. So that's kind of the way we do it. Now, having preached incorporation of manure, I would be remiss if I didn't admit that we have thousands more acres covered this way every year. We have some pretty large dairy farms that set on 40, 50, 80 million gallons of manure storage. And the minute they get their fields planted in the spring, they have their commercial applicators come in and surface apply dairy manure at about 10,000 gallons per acre. This happens to be hog manure at uh, 6,000 gallons per acre. But they do this because it uh, is a way of of getting room in our manure storage. The field's been planted, the moisture from the manure is gonna help with emergence. It's kind of a no-brainer for them now. I would prefer to be incorporated. I did a plot this last year where we compared surface applied manure to incorporate, to surface applied manure that was then um, field or cultivated in the next day, kind of like the old days when I was a kid, we had a field, a real cultivator. Um, and the yield was only about two bushels difference and it wasn't significant. So we may end up having more of these fields cultivated after this manure application, if possible. Now, this is the newest baby and we think we're gonna get to play with this this year. This is Cadman's system. And a Cadman system is basically a hard hose system where all the previous systems we've talked about have been a liquid or soft hose, I'm sorry. And in this situation, you've got a reel down here with a hard hose on. You've got a Cadman applicator. You've got a frack tank. And we've got a semi leaving the scene. And this applicator is going through the field. The advantage of this Cadman system, they developed it off our university research, which is great. But the other thing is, this can go across much taller corn. Previously, I would have said we had about a 35-day window of time to get this manure on. With this Cadman, I think we've just opened up a two month period of time uh, on growing corn that we could do this application. This guy's come down through the field. I'm gonna turn on a video and you're gonna see how he turns on the end away from the hose. And he's got a little wing that he's gonna extend so that that hard hose stays in the same row of corn on the way back. So the only corn that gets flattened in this system it's just a little bit of corn on the turns on the end. This is a concept that was developed by a couple of farmers in Ohio, actually. And Cadman is a Canadian company, so they've built this. So they made, he's made the turn. He's on the radio saying, get that hose started with draw. And the guy's sleeping on the job. You can see he has to pause here. But eventually, yep, his brother wakes up and off they go again. Now, what are the pros and cons of this? Well. The corn can be much taller. Um, if you use incorporation shanks, which these are running airways here today, if you use something to do a little better job of incorporation, you have almost no odor coming off these fields, except these very ends. When he gets all the way back to the other end of the field, this is what happens. So the, you can see the hose is being withdrawn. You can see that hard hose was still in the original row it went down. And his brother can see him here, he's in the tractor. So when he makes this turn on the end, they're simply gonna pull the tractor forward. He's gonna go ahead and fold that wing all the way in, so that's right behind him again. And he's gonna go back down the field. They call this a Cadman continuous manure applicator. When they came out with the original version four or five years ago, uh, it was much bigger than this. It had a booster pump on here. This hose was much longer and bigger. Actually, they had a half mile hose on here, but they found out they couldn't quite pull it all the way down a half mile of field. So they built this silver version. That's what this is called. It was, it was uh, you could seen it last uh, March at the Louisville Farm Show. 
the silver version would be this part here with the roll of hoes and stuff and the toolbar and that's looking for something around 260,000 or so but that's I know everybody says oh my god well their original version was better part of 600,000 so you need to understand that this is quite a step down in price and I think we're going to get to play with this in Northwest Ohio this coming year I believe this will give us as big a window to apply manure as what we have in the fall after corn and soybeans come off. Imagine that. Right now, everybody says it can't be done, but I believe that we will. I think there's just too much value. We're replacing your purchased side dress fertilizer in all of these samples that we've done. So when you look at that replacement of that purchased fertilizer, your manure is actually paying for its own application. It's pretty hard to turn that down or turn down that opportunity. We put a lot of our uh, research results out on Facebook. So if you ever want to follow what I do, I usually post on Ohio State Extension Environmental and Mineral Management. It's an opportunity to see what we're up to, what we're doing. I put a lot of videos and plot results on there. And if you just look at our goal, we want to put the right nutrient in the right place at the right time and the right amount. And that's really what we we are asking the commercial fertilizers people to do. We really need to look at agriculture and our manure side and do a good job. You know, again, I always use the um, sawdust people as an example. Years ago, they would cut trees and everything else went to went on a burn pile. Then eventually, they began to sell firewood off of that. And then eventually, they added glue and made, you know, all kinds of particle board and st trusses and stuff. So. We can do it just like that in agriculture. We can tighten up our manure application uh, to where we're not wasting near as much as we used to. So Dan, with that, that was kind of what I had to talk about. We can take questions or wait. It wouldn't make any difference to me. Well, that was perfect, Glenn. I appreciate it. And I have at least two questions for you uh, okay. before we switch over to Brian. The first one is when you were giving us nitrogen rates, uh, the question is, was that for continuous corn or was it corn on soybean ground? Almost everything here is corn on soybeans. Okay, and I think that question becomes because that's the 200 units is a little higher than we typically think of for maybe a corn soybean rotation in Iowa, but the soils are a little bit different and I think your nitrogen rate recommendations are a little different. The other thing, Dan, we're not really truly incorporating that manure. And if you look at those rolling colders, you're sprinkling manure on top tilled ground. So right now, we're, I'm a little scared to go down to the 5,000 we use with the Dietrich sweeps. But when I look at stock nitrate tests in the fall, we seem to have plenty of nitrogen. So we probably can do lower rates than we currently are running. Perfect. And then the second one was, uh, they were hoping that you could tell them a little more about how you do the enderos with the cadmium system. Well, as the video showed, you just turn on the ends and then they'll come through with some 28 to, uh, to tighten it up. Anywhere you don't put manure, we would probably put a full rate of nitrogen. Anywhere surface applies manure has been made, we would go in with no more than a half rate of nitrogen. So, you know, we would just clean up the field with 28 or anhydrous or whatever our nitrogen choice was. And then I have one question for you. Do you happen to know if your manure applicators are charging roughly the same price for side dressing as they would for normal application per gallon? Or is there a little bit of a surcharge? Or, or At this time, it's the same because I, as a university person, am providing a tractor and a toolbar. So they're just providing a pump and the hoses. But one drawback of the Cadman system that we didn't mention is that they're limited on their flow. Um, I believe 12 or 1400 gallons per acre was what they were running the day I was there. So if we have that pump a little closer, maybe we can get up around 15 or 1600. But if you have a commercial applicator that's accustomed to 3000 gallons per acre or whatever some of the numbers are, um, this might be, in their opinion, a, kind of a slow process. Although good, rich Iowa finishing manure, 1,200 gallons a minute, 1,500 gallons a minute, it doesn't sound so bad to me. Uh, for dairy manure, that might be, be be a little more challenging. Yeah, yeah, but that's uh, it's really neat. You know, if you're a, a double white hog building and you're you've penciled us that you're going to spend five or six thousand dollars this fall on a commercial manure applicator to come in. Uh, um, boy, it'd be nice if you could do it in a growing season and then not, not buy that five or $6,000 worth of nitrogen. Perfect. Once again, thanks, Glenn. Uh, sure. We'll see if anyone else has any questions, feel free to 
unmute and ask them right now or type them in the box. While we're doing that, I think we're going to switch over to Brian, who's going to hopefully show us some work uh, that I think complements this really well with impact of timing for nitrogen in some Iowa fields. So if you have a question, be sure to uh, get it typed in. And I did share a link to Glenn's Facebook page in the chat. I love watching all the videos on there. I think they really help you understand how a lot of these systems work. With that, go ahead, Brian. All right, are you seeing my slides there? I am, it looks perfect. Okay, so uh, I'm Brian Doherty, a field engineer with ISU Extension Outreach, and I'm just gonna take uh, 10 or 15 minutes here and walk you through some research that has been ongoing for the last, I guess it's been five years now, at the Northeast Research and Demonstration Farm near Nashua, Iowa. So got just a couple slides on water quality and gonna talk a little bit about uh, nitrogen uptake with the cereal rye cover crop there. And then we've got some yield data, we've got some uh, yield data with nitrification inhibitors and also some manure timing. So. Just to give you a brief overview of where we're looking at here, so kind of north central, northeast Iowa here, is, uh, if you're not familiar with Nashua, where the, the farm is located. And so what they have there is, uh, th this research is done on some drainage water quality monitoring plots. And so there's 36 one acre plots at this location. And we basically got six different treatment systems there. So these plots are outfitted with a subsurface water quality monitoring system. So essentially we know how much flow uh, is coming out the drainage line in each plot, and then that water is sampled weekly for nitrate and dissolved phosphorus. So these are the plots where all of these uh, slides I'm gonna be showing you, that's where all this data is coming from. So the cover crop management there is pretty standard here uh, for Iowa. So this is a, an early fall swine manure system. So when I say early fall manure, basically that means that manure was applied as soon as possible after harvest in the fall. You know, the soil is generally still warmer than 50 degrees. And later I'm gonna show you some data with the late fall manure application. So with late fall manure, we're delaying that manure application until the soil is cooled below 50 degrees. So early fall, typically somewhere around mid-October, late fall, generally early to mid-November in that case. So we're at 150 pound nitrogen rate with that uh, early fall swine manure. The cereal rye is drilled after harvest, after manure application, 80 pound per acre seeding rate. So that's maybe a little bit higher than uh, what most farmers would probably be doing. Uh, termination in the spring, pretty standard, uh, 10 days to two weeks prior to corn and give or take a couple days on the soybeans. So that's just terminated with glyphosate. So a couple slides here in water quality. So first, I just wanna explain the notation here. So the SU-150, that's the spring UAN side dress treatment. So we're at 150 pound nitrogen rate again on all of these. The EFM, that's our early fall manure. LFM is late fall manure. And the NT stands for no-till. And the plus R here, that's our cereal rye cover crop. So the red line. So not gonna go through all of these, just just want to show you the effect of this uh, cereal rye cover crop on water quality. So what you're seeing here is the cumulative nitrogen loss over this five-year period in pounds per acre. So you can see with the or without the cover crop, uh, almost 220 pounds of nitrogen lost out the drainage line over that five-year period. So essentially, you know, that that's a year and a half worth of nitrogen. We, when you think about we're putting on 150 pounds and we lost. Uh, 220 out the drainage line over five years. Whereas with the cover crop, that was down about 145. So we're seeing about a 30 to 35% reduction in total nitrogen loss out the drainage line with that cover crop. Here's the same plots, but now I'm just showing you the soybean phase of the rotation. So there's no manure applied prior to soybeans. So total losses tend to be lower. And again, we see about a 30% reduction still with uh, total nitrogen loss with that cover crop compared to without in the soybean phase as well. So it's pretty consistent, you know, across the corn soybean rotation that we see that improvement in water quality with the cover crop. 
So what about manure injection? What effect does that have on the cover crop? You can see a picture here from 2016 where you can see a little bit of streaking in the field. And this showed up, I believe, three out of the five years. And uh, this is just a graph showing what that looks like. Essentially what we're seeing is significantly greater biomass growth directly over where that manure was injected. So this chart is showing the pounds of nitrogen in the above ground biomass. So we're not looking at roots here, just the above ground in pounds per acre. So again, the red line there, that's uh, biomass nitrogen over the injection band. The green line is between the injection bands. And then the blue line, that's our soybean plots where there was no manure applied. So you see the first three years there, you know, substantially more nitrogen uptake, especially over that injection band, but just in general where that manure is applied, which is what you would expect. But 2019, you'll notice looks different. So if you remember the fall of 2018, it was very wet, it was cold, it was late when the crop came out. And so that manure actually went on when the soil was about 42 degrees. And so it was actually a late fall application and then the cover crop went in and it froze pretty immediately after that. And so didn't get any growth on the cover crop in that case and so didn't see the streaking didn't see you know more nitrogen uptake whether it was a manure or no manure but still saw about 65 pounds of nitrogen uptake with that cover crop don't have the 2020 data yet unfortunately for nitrogen uptake with the cover crop but one of the interesting things that came out of this uh, if we just kind of summarize that those four years i showed you there we're seeing about 88 pounds of nitrogen uptake prior to corn, about 61 prior to soybeans. And that's significantly higher than what we saw on these same plots in an older study. You know, we had an eight year study using that uh, spring UA inside dress where we had the cereal rye. And in that case, we only saw 21 pounds of nitrogen uptake prior to corn, 13 prior to soybeans. So if you think about the nitrogen dynamics in that system, when you're putting a cover crop in in the fall after spring you in, you're basically just taking up a little bit of residual, you know, available nitrogen in the soil profile. Whereas with that early fall swine manure and the cover crop going in immediately after that, you've got all kinds of available nitrogen right there ready to be taken up by that cover crop. So I think that's the main driver here, just the timing of this. Possible, you know, it was terminated a little bit later in the spring. I'd have to look at the dates on that, but you know, that the longer you can let that go in the spring, that amount of nitrogen in that cover crop will, will increase pretty rapidly. But I think primarily we're just looking at the different timing here. Just a little bit of a thought on the economics of this. We don't often credit our cover crops, but I, I would argue that we, we should be giving our cover crops an economic credit for preventing that nitrogen loss out the drainage line or directly to groundwater. So what I'm showing here, is just the, the average amount over that five year period that it reduced nitrogen loss out the drainage line. So this is using uh, UAN. There's certainly cheaper sources of nitrogen out there, but somewhere around three to six dollars an acre in this case, you know, that, that we basically prevented from going out the drainage line. Now that doesn't mean you're gonna have to go back in and apply that nitrogen, you know. The soil has a very large pool of organic nitrogen, somewhere in the neighborhood of ten thousand pounds per acre. So this is kind of a drop in the bucket, but eventually, you know, if you do this year after year after year, you're losing that nitrogen out the system. You're probably going to have to replace that with either manure or purchase fertilizer. So now I'm going to jump into the corn yields. So again, we're looking at our early fall, late fall manure, and we've also got a spring UA in here, but I'm going to start out just looking at the cover crop comparison with uh, cover crop, no cover crop. So you can see in 2016, we took a big yield hit with the, the cover crop. So 26 bushel per acre yield decline there. But I would take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. That was a transition year from that old spring UAN system. I think we just kind of ran short of nitrogen that first year in the spring there, which is probably, it's hard to say there's a lot of different things going on there, but that's probably why we saw that yield reduction. But then you notice the next three years there, the cover crop treatment actually out yielded the no cover crop comparison. And when you think about how much nitrogen that cover crop is taking up, 
you know, 60 to 80 pounds an acre of nitrogen, you know, think about where that nitrogen went if you didn't have the cover crop. So I, I suspect that's why we're, we're seeing, at least in three out of the five years here, we're seeing that yield advantage with the cover crop in an early fall manure system. You're preventing a lot of nitrogen from being lost out the system. Now 2020, basically, statistically, there's no difference there. 2020 was a very dry year at Nashua, and I suspect that's why we didn't see the yield difference compared to the other years. You know, 2016 through 19 were all normal to wetter than normal years, and that's when we really see, you know, good benefits from the cover crop, both on the water quality side, and it, it appears it probably works a little better on the yield side in that case as well. So we've also got a manure timing study here. So now we're comparing early fall manure and late fall manure with, with no cover crop in this case. This is just manure timing. So if you look across there, you know, 2019 again was a late fall to spring comparison. But if we take those four years where we had the early to late fall comparison, we're seeing on average about a 38 bushel yield advantage with late fall manure compared to early. So just the timing, delaying that manure application until those soils have cooled below 50 degrees has given us a pretty substantial yield advantage here. And again, 2019, that manure went on late and then a lot of our late fall manure didn't go on at all and it was all put on in the spring. So we had a late fall to spring comparison there, 18 bushel advantage. The other interesting thing that, that came out of that sort of accidental experiment there with the late fall to spring comparison is you notice all the other years, uh, the spring UAN side dress pretty substantially out yields all of our fall manure treatments. But in 2019, when that swine manure went on in the spring, there was no yield difference between the spring applied swine manure and the spring UAN side dress. So I don't think it's necessarily that the UAN is a superior nitrogen source here. It's mostly just the timing effect that we're seeing. We also have some continuous corn plots with a, a timing study. So these are uh, 200 pound per nitrogen application rate. So the kind of orange bar there, that's just our late fall manure kind of control. The plus G, that's a gypsum application. I'm not gonna talk about that today. That was part of a water quality study uh, looking at phosphorus leaching. The plus I, that's our instinct uh, nitrification inhibitor put in with that late fall manure. And then the SM, that's spring manure. So if we look at late fall to spring comparison here, we've got four years of data. On average, uh, 28 bushel per acre advantage with spring manure compared to late fall, and this has been continuous corn. Now 2019, all of that manure went on in the spring, no yield difference, so not a big surprise there. It's actually good to see. That tells us those plots are very consistent otherwise, and so this probably, what we're seeing here really is the effect of that manure timing. Now again, 2020, it was a dry year, didn't see any advantage with the spring manure compared to late fall. So first three years, uh, pretty pretty substantial yield advantage there. But again, in a kind of a normal to wetter year seems to be where this uh, the timing makes the biggest difference. So just thinking about the economics of that, uh, I pulled together a bunch of different studies here. So we've got the Nashua data on the top there. Um, there was a very similar study had done in Ames, looking at early and late fall manure and also Wazika, Minnesota. So what I did was just uh, averaged all that data basically. So you see in the bottom there, average of 13 site years of data with uh, early to late fall comparison with swine manure on average, about a 20 bushel per acre advantage. And then looking at late fall to spring, only five years of site data there, but 26 bushel advantage. So somewhere in the 70 to $90 an acre if you assume 350 a bushel corn. So there's not a lot of management things you can do to you know, make that kind of money. And again, you're not gonna see this every year, certainly. You know, we didn't see it in 2020, but on average over the long haul, it, the data seems to show here that you've got a pretty decent chance of seeing a, a pretty uh, decent yield advantage by delaying application, whether that's from early to late fall or late fall to spring. So now we've got our uh, nitrification inhibitor that I mentioned as well. So we've got four years of data here. So in 2017, 18, and 20, um, if you take the three-year average there, it was about a 12 bushel per acre advantage when that fall instinct was put in with 
the manure 2016 that was a transition year so we, we threw that data out we did see yield advantage that year as well but those plots had also been in soybeans the year before so we couldn't really say whether that was attributed to the instinct or not when in 2019 again all of that manure went on the spring they still put the instinct in in the spring just to see what would happen basically no yield advantage with the spring applied instinct and uh that, that's been kind of shown in some other research as well. The nitrification inhibitors tend to be a little more beneficial, you know, in the fall than they are in the spring. So I pulled together a bunch of different studies looking at the instinct as well. And so we've got the Nashua data at the top here. Again, uh, late fall manure at the 70 ounce instinct rate, 12 bushel advantage. A uh, bunch of data from Wazik and Minnesota, again, looking at both early and late fall manure at different instinct rates. And so you can see at Wazika with the early fall manure, they did see a yield advantage and they did not see a yield advantage with the late fall manure. So anything with an asterisk there is not statistically significant. Boone, Iowa, same basic setup there, early and late fall at different rates. You know, statistically, there was no yield differences there. so. If you just kind of look at the data overall, it looks like maybe half the time it, there's an economic advantage with that instinct with the fall manure. And some years it, it's probably kind of a break even. You have to factor in the cost of that instinct. I don't have current data on that. If somebody does, I'd like to hear what that's costing. I believe it's somewhere around $10 an acre, and that would be at the lower rate. So you got to factor in that cost as well. So just to summarize, kind of some tips I give, you know, when I'm presenting this to farmers, you know, definitely it's going to take more management if you're going to manage a cover crop in this system, you know, encourage people to treat it just like it's any other cash crop. The other thing I didn't cover in this presentation, but the effect of keeping your equipment maintained and calibrated is, is pretty huge. The field engineers did some work a few years back looking at application uniformity across the toolbar and found that if you've got loops in your hoses or plug vents, you, you can have pretty serious issues with uneven application in the field itself. And then just uh, different ways to reduce those pathways for nutrient loss to make the most out of your manure. Again, wait to apply that manure until the soil is cooled down, put a cover crop in. Again, I didn't cover the low disturbance injectors here, but just saw some information hot off the press this morning from the University of Minnesota where they're injecting manure into established cover crops and they're finding that that does work as long as you have a low disturbance injector and then you know delay that manure application timing if at all possible i showed the data on that so i'm going to wrap it up there happy to take any questions or discussion Thanks, Brian. I think that is some really interesting data and you had uh, some great ways of presenting it there for how the timing really impacted yields and potential money. I, I really appreciate you sharing that with us today. Uh, if anyone has any questions for Brian or Glenn, please do feel free to unmute or type them in the chat. Um, Brian, uh, when you start to lower that manure rates down let's say 150 175 170 pounds a man coming from that manure um and we're using cereal rye and it's effective at taking it up do we start to worry about um not having enough in there for that corn i would say your main concern there is going to be when you terminate that cover crop so if you're terminating a couple weeks ahead of time i Generally, haven't seen, you know, we, we haven't, uh, that's kind of how we've handled it at, in Nashua. Um, prior years, um, they were waiting a little longer to terminate that corn, and we did in that old spring UAN system, or, you know, pardon me, to terminate the cover crop and the corn. Um, they were terminating, you know, within three or four days of planting that corn. We saw some pretty, pretty big yield hits pretty much every year when that cover crop was used at spring UAN, but Especially swine manure, I don't think it's going to be that different from a spring UAN, but the rate, I wouldn't worry about so much, you know, the overall rate. It's just more when you apply that and when you terminate your cover crop. So I, yeah, I would say if, if you're going to plant green, certainly you're going to have 
some nitrogen tie-up issues, you're going to see a yield hit for sure. So in that case, you know, we'd encourage people to put some nitrogen on with the planter. And then there is a question about uh, what are the availability factors used in Iowa and Ohio and are they similar? And that's a great question. Uh, I don't want to speak for Ohio. I did not look through that. If you're looking for a comparison of how Iowa, Minnesota, and Illinois might give recommendations for uh, manure, I'll share a link in just a second of a blog. As for Iowa and Ohio, uh, as I'm sure most of you are aware, the I Iowa summary is uh, swine manure would be 90 to 100 percent available in the first year. Uh, if you are injecting or immediately incorporating, you're looking at almost no volatilization losses, uh, maybe 1% for injection, up to 5% for uh, incorporation with the same day. And if you are surface applying, I shouldn't quote this off the top of my head, uh, you're looking somewhere around 15 to 30% volatilization losses. I don't know what, what you're sort of thinking there in Ohio, Glenn. I think with dairy manure, our suggested availability is uh, 50 to 60%. I think sometimes you'll see dairy manure that has more of its nitrogen and ammonia than maybe what our availability is. So I recommend using that availability with a little caution, but Glenn, yeah. could you give us a brief summary of some Ohio numbers there? Yeah, that it is a confusing topic. Um, I, I assume that it's just about 100% on the ammonium nitrogen portion of the swine manure, which is most of the swine manure. So, uh, but I've seen numbers, I've even our own people say only 70% that, of that's available, but I beg to differ because we, we really get good results with figuring just 100% and go. So I guess that would be my thought. And then on, on the on the dairy side, as we've switched away from organic material for bedding and the sand, the portion of the dairy manure that's in the ammonium form has shot up pretty rapidly and the organic portion is shot down pretty rapidly. So it's never gonna be quite like hogs, but, but it's not unusual to start looking at uh, 20 units of ammonium nitrogen and a thousand gallons of dairy manure where we never would have thought more than six or eight at one time. So, you know, again, there's, I think you just have to, to, to test and the only manure tests that I ever rely on are the ones that are pulled during the application process. Um, that way, you know, it's been stirred and agitated and handled and whatever. We did plug in, um, we did use the John Deere sensor this year, this past year. We put it in line in one of our drag hose systems. And then I think TopCon, we might get their sensor to stick in another one of our drag hoses and trying to get those instantaneous readings. And uh, what we did is we ran that in three or four farms last year, and then we had a grad student that pulled manure samples from a nozzle that we created on the toolbar, and then he compared those. So I have about a 30 minute talk from him that um, I can share with somebody if they want to, but it's gonna be at the Conservation Tellers Conference here in about a week as well here in Ohio. Perfect, thanks Glenn. Uh, and with that, uh, Glenn did mention that John Deere sensor. Uh, I wanted to pitch our next Manure Monday. Uh, Laura Peppel and one of their applicators from Puck Custom Enterprises is planning to join us next time. Uh, they'll go through some of the drag line tips, best practices and uh, experiences they've had. And they, Laura is working on providing an update on some of the work they've been doing with the John Deere nutrient sensor. So I know that was a question on a previous episode. Uh, she does plan to share some work they've done on how well it hit different nutrient answers based on what they measured and then show us some of the variability throughout uh, pumping out a pit or two. So something to look forward to. Uh, any more questions or comments from anyone? If not, I have one more thing I want to pitch today. Uh, Sean Schaus has been making a podcast. It is tons of fun to listen to. Uh, Brian was his guest on the previous one on cold weather ventilation, which was perfectly timed before it got frigid here in Iowa. Uh, so it was really timely and lots of fun to listen to. I haven't had the chance to listen to this one yet, uh, but it is Engineering Your Farm podcast. I'll share a link. And this one's on the science, stinky science of measuring farm odor. And he talks to Yasek Kozil. So if you are looking to expand your podcast, uh, 
interest and want to hear about some farm odors or other interesting engineering problems on the farm, I think this is episode four. Uh, the previous one was on ventilation and there was a fun one on uh, robotic weed management. So a range of topics, uh, but at least this one and a couple others are, are relatively timely for those of us in the livestock industry. So once again, thank you to both Brian and Glenn. I loved hearing what you both had to say. I felt it was really informative. Uh, I love the, the drone videos of Glenn. I think it's always useful to see how they're doing it in the field and how people are really trying to, trying to make it work in the system. So thanks for joining us today. We appreciate it. Brian, always a pleasure to see you. And thanks to everyone for joining us.